little glass of water, please. A fresh pressed hanky if I sneeze. Some tea with honey from the bees. Whenever you can. Uh, everything. What happened to start last night? Not well. <laughs> what was my breakfast? I had um, lox and bagels. So we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, just in time. <laughs> to actually do introductions, this guy, of course, has played roles in such franchises as Star Trek and My Little Pony, but I think we all know he's most famous for his roles in Stargate, Breaking Bad, and the Star Galactica. Hmm? The original Battle Star Galactica. So, anyway, everyone, John Delancey. So how are we going to do this? It's usually pretty casual, just, you know, people okay. well, ask, ask out, ask away. back and forth. Can you tell us anything about your upcoming season five episode? Oh. I, <laughs> I, as I said before, it has a lot to do with a glue factory. <laughs> <laughs> and a hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> <laughs> Very special. <laughs> Has a sort of finality to it. <laughs> um, so yesterday at the uh, voice actors panel, which you weren't on, unfortunately, um, some of the voice actors talked about talk, this fandom is something that they haven't seen since something like Star Trek. And I thought it might be interesting to get your perspective on it because you've seen both Trekkies and Bronies now. So what are some, some of the like, similarities and differences between these two fandoms, as you call them? Well, um, when I went through the, I think, the, the normal uh, or usual kind of um, surprise about the fandom, and, uh, which I indicated in that documentary, which I did, which interestingly enough, so, uh, 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 which was, you know, why are 20 year old guys watching a cartoon intended for 10 year old girls? Um, which is exactly what the writers went through. They, they, they just, the, the, I, I've had an opportunity now to talk to a number of them and they were saying, well, you know, all of a sudden we went, wait a minute. Who is our audience here? This audience is changing. It was when I went through that, which was a, a, you know a period of about a week and a half or two. Um, I then all of a sudden met some bronies up in, I think it was Vancouver, and I asked them. I said, "Why are you interested in this show? I mean, what? Okay, because I hadn't seen it, but it just felt like it was off. I was sort of." Something was strange, and uh, and then they began to explain to me, and I um, I don't want to say immediately, but it dawned on me within the end of a couple of conversations that um, th that they were on to something, and having been a uh, having been involved in Star Trek, but not in the original Star Trek, but also being quite uh, close to Leonard. Nimoy, because he and I had a company together, and we would see each other, you know, for for those reasons, or have lunch and what have you. I had heard a lot of stories about how here was you know, wagon train to the stars, you know, and it was a, a, essentially a failed TV show, failed because back then TV shows were were judged by their longevity, and they were up against things like. Wagon Train and um, Gunsmoke and things like that that had been around for were were going on to 17 years. So to to be uh, almost canceled at the end of the first season, definitely going to be canceled by the end of the second season, was a, essentially a failed show. But what what had happened is that Wagon Train to Wagon, or Star Trek, Wagon Train of the Stars, was definitely a show intended for guys. It was a guys show. And uh, you might not uh, um, appreciate this, 
it, it's, it's hard to, to, even for me, who kind of lived through it, but I wasn't maybe quite old enough at the time. But uh, in 1965, the notion that a girl would be watching, a woman would be watching a science fiction show sort of made her a little odd. Something was a little off. She should be watching the romances, not this hard-boiled stuff over here. And what is, um, I, what I found to be, uh, what I know to be really quite extraordinary is that it was a woman who brought Star Trek back. Her name was B. Jo Trimble. You might look her up, she's still alive. She was the one who created the first write-in campaign, I mean, of a mega nature. Uh, NVC got a million letters, and I don't mean emails. I mean, uh, you know, you, you don't write it, and then uh, like this, and you know, put it in, and take it down to the post office. So there was effort, and they were flabbergasted. Nobody had ever had that happen. Um, and um, so I just thought, wow, there seems to be, a, it's guys who are watching a show intended for little girls, but they have extrapolated from that something which is quite, un which is nobody anticipated. And, that ha and they have created something else over here and used it sort of as a tent under which they can come and find um, uh, community and sanctuary and stuff like that, which is exactly what took place back in 65 because having been alive back in 65 and, and right at that age of whatever I was, 14 or something like that, um, I, uh, I can tell you that if you weren't into sports, I don't know, there wasn't much else to go. But there were many other, and I wasn't into sports. I just wasn't in sports. I, I've, I've never been in sports. I, I don't get it. I don't. I don't care enough about it. Oh, occasionally I watch something, but it's. You know. But I had friends who were you know, you know they they knew all the stats and they you know they were not. And I thought, oh, like that. But I was into science fiction. And I went to all the movies, and I had my you know my monster uh, makeup kits and and all that type of stuff which was considered a little strange. Um, so I thought, well, this is just, I, I'm beginning to see parallels here. Not, not absolute parallels, but, but um, close indications. And then, as you know, um, uh, because my, my friend who had said, uh, uh, you know, that, that the night that he came, when I discovered, I went, uh, I had looked at my emails, and seen all these emails and I said to my wife my, my MLP my little pony what, what is that she goes well it's a it's a it's a you know animation that you voiced uh, about and it's a cartoon for little girls and I said well these are not little girls that are writing I mean I don't know what this is um, since then I I began to piece all of this stuff together and that's when my friend, who had said, let's do a documentary, this is now I'm moving into the documentary, let's do a documentary, and um, once I had made contact and had, and had met some bronies and had m and begun to understand a little bit about what was going on, he threw into the thing this, you know, the, the, the typical kind of conservative, uh, politically, uh, um, uh, uh, mean-spirited type of uh, stuff that goes on in our country way too much, and then I went, okay, we're we're, we're going to make this documentary because surely the people, the, the Star Trek people, the women back in '65 needed a little bit of cover, and the guys in whatever it was, 2010 or 11, uh, might benefit from some cover here where at least we could do a documentary that shows who they are before people other people begin to identify them because that was beginning to move really quickly so. Thank you. very long-winded answer sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some of the 
are some of the differences in the conventions, I guess. Because uh, I guess Star Trek, you do a lot of Comic Con and stuff. Um, and then there's obviously Brony Con. And the differences in the convention, is, 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 again, I'm going to go back to the things. The, the first conventions for Star Trek were um, in people's living rooms. Um, and when I spoke to the, to the people who ran BronyCon back three or four years ago, I said, um, I said, listen, I'd like to come and film, but I don't know how many people you have. What, what was your first convention? Well, we had 50 people at a restaurant. We moved from, you know, our, my living room or whatever to 50 people at a restaurant. Our next time was we had 350 people in a hotel. And we're hoping that if you come, we'll get maybe 700 people. So, I said, well, okay. Well, it was like 4,000. It was 4,000 because I, I, I remember saying, well, what if I and Lauren Faust and Tara Strong came? Because. <laughs> Oh, so what, what are the differences? The differences are that those, um, those early conventions for many, many, many years were, were, uh, were a little like this. You know, t quiet in the room and, you know, there'd be a little something to eat and people would talk about. Oh, very quiet. It's when the promoters got in and they went, oh, well, this is, you know... <laughs> We can use the, 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 the notions of a car show and apply it to, to, to this. And so they began, you know, monetizing the thing. And then, so, so for most of us who've been doing these things for quite a while, um, we like the fan conventions, but they're usually more um, exhausting for us. Um, but the Brony convention has remained, and I was, it was fun last, yesterday when I, um, was waiting to come on. You know, everybody was outside, uh, everybody was in the hall and the music was on and everybody was dancing, or not dancing, but singing and waving their arms. That you do not see in a, in a Star Trek convention. So there's, there's a big sense of community here and also I think a big sense that um, you are doing something um, special and, um, and you are uh, involved in a um, in breaking new ground in terms of how um, how people interact with each other. Uh, and it really, you know, it's again the whole issue of don't judge a book by its cover. I, I, I love that, I, I keep on, I, I loved that kid in the documentary who, who showed his fingernails, you know. And for a lot of America, they would go, they would recoil at that. And I love that zone because you have to go, no, you have to get past your, you know, immediate right off the, you know, you have to get past all of that and understand that the world is much more complicated and not as simple as these little reactions that you have. But we're going into new pregnancy presidential campaign, so you can imagine we're all going to go back to a kind of a Neanderthal thing. <laughs> did you watch the debate the other night? I did. What did you think? <laughs> How does it retain about the public? <laughs> this is what I think, actually, that those guys are not on your side. That's what I think. That's the area I, 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 I usually say I love good party, and I'm yeah. going to say it looks like a bunch of animals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you vote, and if you want to have some sort of influence on the type of world you live in, I, I, I found it. I mean, there were two or three guys up there who I thought, oh, well, they're, they're legit. And there are, you know, the rest of them, I just went, oh. the things that, and it's, it's, it's sad to me because I don't think that they're stupid or ignorant. I think that they're willfully deceptive. Um, they're just things that are said that you just kind of go, you know that that's not true. They need to appeal for their case. What's that? They need to appeal 
they're needing to appeal to their base and um, you know which uh, oftentimes are not known for critical thinking well I mean my I, I, I thought I uh, that they they're not they're not on your side oh, okay, okay. Th that's how it applies to my life. <laughs> okay. yeah, they're not going to understand you and they might sh want to shut you down. I have a question. Um, tying in a little bit to that, my big joke after the debate is there was a movie called Idiocracy that came out um, several years ago. Right. And my joke is now I see that my joke was, oh, it's uh, getting closer and closer to a documentary. Now it doesn't feel so much like a joke anymore. Right. But yet, you know, you would say, you just made a comment that you know they're not on your side. You know, that, um, that it's it's kind of a negative flow from certain individuals in, in that area. But Jenny, you, you see My Little Pony with a, such a positive vibe coming from that. Does it sometimes get into your head when you see negativity and you think, you know, the Bronies and the My Little Pony? Does it kind of spur you on to? Like, be the change you want to see in the world, and, and knowing that you know you have all this free time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite understanding the question, though. Sorry. Um, with, with you know, with what you do with My Little Pony and seeing you know all the bronies and and the positive um, vibes that are coming out of this fandom and the show itself, when you see negativity, do you kind of just touch base with? You know the bronies and the you know the, that 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 um, the positivity that you see in My Little Pony and the brony community, and decide you know what I'm going to be a little bit better, try to you know be you know affect positive more positive change. If, even if it's just saying stuff like they're not on your side. Well, that's what I was just going to say. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm moving into territory here, which is not usually what one moves into, and I'm doing it a little sort of on thin ice, feeling a little on thin ice, because I, I also feel that everybody has a right to have their own opinions about these things. Um, but I was asked straight on what I thought <laughs> think about it, and I was asked straight on in, in context of My Little Pony, and in context of this. And, and in context of uh, of a lot of things that ha that where where the world of my, where the world of bronies lives, okay, and um, um, I don't see a lot of uh, live and let live um, in in I, I I didn't see very much of that in that in that um, debate last night. And and also, I don't see very much just just telling the just just um, what the reality is, as opposed to a constant attempt to change or impose somebody else's reality on the situation. And um, I, I'm skirting it a little bit. Obviously, if I were at home in the confines of my friends and what have you, and not had a bunch of cameras on me, <laughs> I would be uh, I would be um, much more clear about this, but I, um, I think you can extrapolate from my uh, answers <laughs> sort of where I where I, I sit about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, Bring it back kind of more towards the fandoms. Uh, what have been some of your favorite fan interactions? Whether it's My Little Pony, Star Trek, anything else you've done? Um, well, in both instances, like I said yesterday, you know, we do these shows. Um, well, I'll, I'll just speak my class. I, I do these shows. They, they, they. I'm a totally a project-oriented person. As far as I'm concerned, I have a life that's going down a path, and then, and then, as if you were walking that path, you go, oh, well, what is that over here? And you go down that little path, but it's a little one. It's uh, these are smallish paths. You know, you go and smell the flowers here, or you go in a little bit further you know, and, and visit the brook over there, which, which is a metaphor for how long a, a, a project lasts for me. But I'm still always sort of moving down my path. Um, I'm sorry, I, uh, 
repeat your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I knew I was on to something, but I just forgot what it was. Um, yeah, what have been some of your favorite fan interactions? Oh, oh, so for me, for me, um, the, the, the shows represent just a little bit of, the, of these, you know, jump offs from this path. What I have now more of in terms of these shows is the experience of the fans far more than I do of the show itself. Far more. You know, for My Little Pony, it takes me, you know, I live in that world for maybe four hours per episode. A couple of hours to, to, to do it, a couple of hours to record it. But it's here that I live in, in the world much more fully and much for people are still talking to me about about um, um, uh, 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 things that you know like for for you know what was it what was it like when you came in on that throne in you know the opening episode of I don't know, well that was 30 20 eight years ago. <laughs> so I, I relive those things through that. But it's mostly with the fans that I have um, a real connection. Um, and then there have, been, there have been so many experiences. Um, and for the most part, they've all been really good. None of them have been bad. Some of them have been like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like this one to end pretty quickly. But for the most part, they've been really good. So, somebody over here. We can move over there. <laughs> yes. You did some work in a uh, video game. Uh, what does it differ to do work in a, um, let's say, like a 4A video game that it does for like a television show, your voice acting? Well, one is your face is on. You mean? No, no, no. Uh, you did voice acting. Yeah, you did your, vo you did your voice acting for My Little Pony, and then you did your voice acting for, I think it was Assassin's Creed. Uh huh. Uh, was there, like, was there any like really big differences? in how you would um, uh, record your lines or what kind of direction you'd take it, or is it pretty much a standard stuff? like? Uh... It's sort of standard. Assassin's Creed was a little more complicated because they put the, an, a helmet on you. They did? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with a very intrusive, very bright series of LEDs. <laughs> so, and the, so they are filming you as you're saying the lines oh. so that they can apply that to the... Um, to the, you know, to were you, were the you not a fan? What's that? Were you not a fan? <laughs> oh no, I actually uh, of that of that technique because at the end of because at the end of, of, of those sessions, you would walk out and people would say, "Oh, that was really that's good." And as you're walking out, they're handing you a glass of water and a bottle of Advil. <laughs> <laughs> you, and, and she said, "Do you want some?" I said, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> Well, she goes, I know, everybody feels the same way. Um, 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 I was a fan to the extent that my kids had played uh, Assassin's Creed. And I liked, um, I, I thought the, the kind of detailing, the verisimilitude in terms of reconstructing, you know, Florence, and I think the other one was... Uh, Constantinople, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It was just terrific. And since I'm a big history nerd, I think, yeah, I think you were also in the one where it was revolutionary America. Yeah, you were in the one that was revolutionary America, I think too. I was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I've got. Um, I, I'm in the. I'm in the process of, of finishing one for Starcraft. Well, the uh, new expansion. That's awesome. And then, and then one that I'm actually very um, um, excited about, which is. Um, uh, I'm going there tomorrow at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, um, I'm going. I'm flying to Las Vegas for the introduction of a new game called Timelines, and it's a Star Trek game. And in that, uh, uh, Q uh, uh, has screwed things up again. <laughs> a lack of a better word. <laughs> And has allowed the the um, uh, 
has allowed the player who comes in as a captain of a ship has allowed the player the opportunity to pick any and all characters that have been in the entire panoply of Star Trek to create their dream teams that go off and, and do stuff. Um, I went to, it's Disruptor Beam is the, is the company, and they did Game of Thrones. And these are really, uh, I, I went to um, be with them for five days in Boston, and I, I wanted to do this particularly because normally what I do is that I just spend my time talking, uh, you know, just, I, you know, I go in, I you know, say the lines, and that's the end of it, two hours. But this was an opportunity for me to go and uh, see exactly how it was made, um, you know, all, all that type of stuff. So meet all the people, they're really bright people, and also to make sure, you know, not, not, I shouldn't say make sure, but to have confirmed to me that they were tr people who really loved Star Trek. I, I think it's important when you are dealing with a, a property like that, uh, that you like the property. You know, nothing would be more unpleasant if, if somebody took over My Little Pony and sort of didn't get it. You know, I don't know, it's sort of weird, but we're doing it anyway. You know, you kind of go, no, that's not the right person. So, yes? Uh, speaking of Star Trek and captains, can you comment at all on the rumor that William Shatner may end up making a cameo, and have you sort of encouraged him to do that? <laughs> yes. I love these rumors. Um, I, I don't know. I see Bill frequently, uh, so I will ask him. Well, Jim Miller was asking him on Twitter, say, hey, when do you get star? <laughs> he said, contact me when I get back. I'm on a trip for next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, he, uh, I've told him about, the, about this, so. Uh, What's his reaction? Uh, uh, you know, Bill's, Bill's v always very interested in it, just about everything. <laughs> so, um, he, he didn't, he was like, oh. I mean, and also, you know, there's a certain, I'd like to think that there's a certain, um, um, it, you know, it depends sometimes on who it is. And, um, I met Bill through through Leonard. Uh, Bill knows that I do, you know, some good work, and I wouldn't be talking to him about something if I weren't interested in it. You know, something like that. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the Starfleet Academy. Is there any other more questions? Any other highlights of your career you'd be willing to talk about? Well, you need to be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you still remember working on Battlestar Galactica? Is there all kind of a haze at this point? That one is a real haze. I can tell you this much, is that I got a call in the morning. I was under contract for Universal. I got a call in the morning, and it was, uh, we have a job for you, and you have to leave right away. <laughs> I went, okay. I had this speech that was like this long, and the, I'm not a great line learner. Um, and uh, we shot at night, and I had the time to learn the speech, but just barely. They put me in some crazy outfit with, 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 a, with a headphone, and they plopped me between, in a canyon out in the desert with big, big, you know, walls of rock on either side. And uh, I'm there and I'm going, you know, I'm going over the material, going over the material, the camera's far away. And, uh, and then they said, it's action. And all of these, you know, the vehicles and people are, you know, like running towards me and stuff like that. And I'm supposed to say the lines, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. Uh, so it was a, it was more than a baptism of fire, and, and uh, you know, I got the lines out, I think, uh, and uh, and that was it. And I was like, oh god, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah. So. Um and I know it's been a few years since you've been to Roman Con. How would you say that uh, is the experience any different this time than it was last time we were here? 
Well, you know, my experience of BronyCon the last time was is that it was in a it was um, it it it's become more organized. There's no question about it. And I I I haven't really seen anything. I mean, I I was here yesterday. What was it? I got in the 9:30. There was the opening thing. I then went immediately to uh, to talk, the talk, I guess. Then from there, I went to the Make a Wish uh, event. Then I went downstairs at one o'clock and I signed until seven. And then I left. <laughs> yeah, I, and I'm like, um, so we're we're into more of the. It, it, it's the the one on on um, the one in New York was just sort of c coming together and everything was together and you it was more cacophonous. Uh, um, uh, so so, but I I don't I don't know I haven't gone down to the dealer's room I, I haven't gone anywhere, uh, which I would very much like to do, but I just. I just haven't. I mean, after this, in 15 minutes, I'm going to talk, and then right after that, <laughs> I guess I'm going to sign. I don't, I don't even know what I'd do after that. So, so. yeah. Are you voicing? Um, so you're mainly known for Discord and My Little Pony. Are you potentially voicing any other characters coming up, or do they want you to in in them? in in My Little Pony? Or do they sort of want to keep your voice just with Discord? Uh, well, I think that my voice is sort of um, distinctive enough that I don't think you can. I, I'm, I've been doing um, Brainiac, Brainiac, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I'm going to be doing some more work for um, um, Blizzard. So. No, we don't, or at least I don't, tend to know these things in advance. They just, they, they come from the future to me. <laughs> okay. yeah. What did you think about the fact that uh, Discord was kind of like the special guest character that appeared once, and then the story writers decided to start introducing him as kind of like a semi-regular character? Um, so what did I think about the fact that it, it, it happened once and it becomes semi-regular? You know, I've had that happen now a number of times in my career. Um, the first time, actually, was for soap opera. Um, I had been asked to do um, a soap opera. Uh, I had never seen a soap opera. Uh, I, I, uh, I had just finished a, a year up in the theater up in Seattle. I came down, and I had a soap opera game. A friend of mine who, who I had known from Universal days, who was a producer at Universal, was now over at this soap, and she just gave me the job. Um, the job was to be for uh, five days, and I was to play a psycho, uh, uh, which I had played a number of times before, and it was like rolling off a log. But I took a look at the show, and I went, hmm, they want a psycho, but they need a comedian. That's what the show needs. So um, I did that, and uh, at the end of the five days, um, they uh, came out as I was getting into the car, and they said, we're going to be bringing you back. So that was my first experience of that. And it was a very, I created a very popular character that people still talk about. Um, then the next one was Star Trek. Okay. Um, so that was a, was an event. There was another one in there um, uh, that I can't remember right now. So I, I've had a little bit of that experience uh, and it's fun. I mean in this case I did not look at the show beforehand and it really came I mean I know you're going to find this as a surprise because it seemed to be obvious to everybody but me is that um, I wasn't thinking about Q at all. I never do. You know, it would be as if I, you know, just shot a show and I'm, well, I'm doing it like Discord. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that way. There's a certain rhythm, a certain vibration that every all, all material always has, um, um, and which is different. 
and you work off of that and you filter it through yourself obviously the 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 the, the component that's the same as me but I wasn't thinking of that it was only after I think um, uh, Lauren said well you know you're here because we I was pitching the show and that they didn't quite understand the, the character and, you know and I then I said well it like you on Star Trek and one of the suits said oh my god do you think we could get to Lancey so uh, and then that was just, well, I don't know, at least make a phone call. Um, so, um, uh, so that doesn't, um, so in any case, that, that, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. And, and I'm delighted to have been on something that um, is as um, socially or, or culturally relevant as, as, Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek is sort of the touchstone of, you know, how a show can change the, the world. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say to me, um, you know, it's because of you that I'm in NASA, you know, or, you know your show, the, the, the show you're on, so I'm in NASA. Well, it's fun now to be in a show that means so much to so many people, My Little Pony. Um, and. Um, you know, and I remember at the beginning saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a documentary on bronies. Brownies? <laughs> bronies? You mean brown? Br you mean brown? No, not brownies. <laughs> no. <laughs> bronies. <laughs> I watched the brownie documentary. A brownie documentary. It's classic. <laughs> but but now people really know what you know. They know what you're talking about. They go, oh yeah, how you're involved with that. So, so that's fun. Yeah. Um, are you planning on changing the future? Uh, are you planning on changing the world again in the future? <laughs> Am I planning on changing what? Maybe the world again. Again. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 Any last like quick thirty second questions? Because we need to wrap up now. Yes. Yes. Um, so what made you what made you change your mind about using Twitter again? Oh, uh, the people for the game asked me to uh, involve myself with that. And, and I went, okay. <laughs> um, um, I haven't quite yet understood the concept behind it. I keep on thinking that I'm talking to one person. You know, somebody writes me and I respond. And I keep on being told, no, no, you don't understand. You're talking to everybody. So, uh, 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 so, in any case, that was the reason. Yeah, there's people in the back who have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, my question to you would be, um, for several years now, you've been you know, answering questions from the community, often the same question multiple times. So, my question to you is, do you have any questions that you would like to ask us as the community that maybe no one has ever asked you before? Well, um, how long, if, if the show is not husbanded well by the people who make it. I don't mean the, literally the people who make it, but the company who makes it. Will this continue? Uh, I'd say, yeah. Three, four years, maybe. <laughs> Even if it's just a case of enjoying the nostalgia purely stuff, I don't think it'll ever be completely managed. I think that if Star Trek can have such a lasting yeah. presence, mm -hmm. uh, how many episodes did the original Star Trek have? 70, 70, I think. Just, just, just 70. Season and they still got good so if I think there's a lot of parallels that we can see. Yeah, I, I, gonna be that is my... There's a bad taste in the mouth. Right, that is my feeling as well. I, I think that there's enough material out there. And also there is a, enough original material out there. And what I find to be really fascinating and encouraging about this community when I try to explain it to people who really don't understand. I say, you know, listen, um, uh, this didn't happen when we were kids because we did not have these resources. But just imagine the kid who might be, you know, just sort of quiet there and you kind of go, I don't know what's going on with him, who goes upstairs, flips on the computer, and it's got you know two or three screens going, and it's talking on Skype to people in Singapore, and you know, and, and you know, 
uh, Berlin and stuff like that, who's looking at uh, 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 original material and saying, gee, I could read, you know, do this with new songs and I could do this with, you know, reanimate this in a certain way and what have you. This is a very creative and a very outreached, a, a, a worldwide community. Um, I, I just hope you you continue. I continue. You continue on. I mean, my sense is is that after um, um, that the seed was planted, I'm happy that I was involved early-ish on where the watering was was taking place. But I see now that the tree is really growing. Um, and that um, while there might be you know, it's a lot of the originals, I think, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm afraid to say most of the original people who were involved are no longer there. There's still some, but you know, this is the same story that happens everywhere. At first it's, you know, oh, I don't know, it's a little something over here, you know, it's below our radar. You know, you know, and then it, because, and then all of a sudden the the monolith turns and goes like this, and that can be um, that can be a, a wilting experience, if not a, a, a death knell. Um, uh, but I think that the tree can withstand um, a lot here, and uh, and I love the feeling of what it it represents. Um, and so, in the same way that I say, well, these people are not going to be on your side, uh, and going back to the political statement I made, uh, there's also such a thing as being your own parent, and, uh, and just going, you know what, we don't need a constant new supply. We can keep this going and create, and create our own. So. So. Yeah. I think that's all the time we've got now. Oh. He's got to get to another event. So okay. thank you, everyone. No, okay, thank you thanks. Faithful and strong, sharing kindness, it's an easy feat, and magic